Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Right now on Indiana News Desk. The health care exchanges are online, but many folks hoping to sign up for insurance were greeted by this, wait messages. This is brand new. Uh, almost certainly there will be some, some bumps in the road initially. With the lack of federal funding to explain the new health care system, volunteers are stepping up to educate the uninsured. Federal offices in Indiana are still shut down and Hoosiers are feeling the impact. I've, I've been locked out from my job, I cannot perform my job, I cannot volunteer to do my job. And uh, so that's, that's the road I'm, I'm on now. And an Indiana winery powered by alternative energy. As cloudy as it was and everything, it still put out energy and I could not believe that. It actually worked. More on the first winery in the Midwest to run on sunshine. Those stories and a look at the week's top headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Ren and welcome to Indiana News Desk. A deadline came and went this week for Congress to agree on a new budget. So since Tuesday, the government has been shut down. You may not have even noticed since you're still getting your mail and if you filed for a tax extension, you still have to pay it on October 15th. But as Gretchen Frazee reports, thousands of Hoosier workers are feeling the impact and the longer the shutdown continues, the worse it will get. Many of the desks at the National Guard headquarters in Indianapolis sat empty Tuesday. 1,000 federal technicians across the state had been sent home because of the government shutdown. Jeff Lowry was one of the last to leave. I'm going to look for another, another job. You know, it's, there, are, there are things I need to do to provide for myself and my family, and uh, that's what I'm going to have to do. Lowry and his co-workers were given four hours to clean out their emails and cancel any meetings. This is the second time this year Lowry has been furloughed. He had to take off six days this summer because of sequestration. That didn't affect me too much. You know, I still was able to drill on weekends. I was able to supplement my my day-to-day -day income that way. So this is going to be a harder hit because this is going to be zero percent income for the time being. All the units within the Indiana National Guard and all the directors are required to uh, determine what is mission essential and what is um, required to be done. And of course, we'll do our best to fill those gaps without those federal technicians in our folds. In other words, the National Guard had to decide what and who were essential, those that were not getting furloughed. Indiana has around 22,000 federal employees, and all federal departments had to go through the same process to determine who got to keep their job and who didn't. That's led to many federal departments offering limited or no service. In addition to the National Guard furloughs, the national parks in Indiana, including the Indiana National Dunes Lakeshore, and even the National Parks Department website have shut down. Veterans Affairs hospitals and clinics are still fully operational, but those applying for new benefits could see delays. Some federal courts are cutting back on their workloads, but Hoosiers are still getting their Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security checks. And the U.S. Postal Service and Federal Highway Administration, along with some other transportation services, are still open because they get their funding from fuel taxes rather than congressional appropriations. The um, Hoosier voter should be outraged. This is not the way a great government conducts itself. Lee Hamilton was a congressman the last time the federal government shut down in 1995 and 1996. Back in the 80s and the 90s, a long time ago, you would have an occasional crisis come along and a government shutdown occurred. Here, we're dealing with it all the time. If we solve this problem, uh, we got one two weeks from now. Uh, with the debt ceiling increase. Hamilton says Indiana's congressional delegation has spent too much time bickering instead of trying to come to a solution. He says until they stop trying to assign blame, things are likely going to get worse. Everything will become more difficult. Uh, running the Defense Department, running the FBI, uh, because you're dealing with problems that accumulate during a shutdown. 
In the meantime, the state government is filling in some of the gaps. Indiana has enough cash reserves to maintain some federal programs, such as food support for low-income women and children, for another month. The state is also spending around $33,000 a day, paying the salaries of more than 240 National Guard state employees, who are typically reimbursed through the federal government. The governor has promised to pay those workers for one week. If the government is still shut down come next Tuesday, he says he'll have to reassess the situation. And we're now joined by political science professor Marjorie Hershey with more on the government shutdown. Well, here it is, day four. Any updates for us? I only wish. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid this may take a long time. The last time we had a shutdown, as Representative Hamilton has said, in 1995-96, it took 21 days under two separate shutdowns to get this resolved. And uh, the big question is, on October 17th, we run out of the government's uh, ability to borrow money. The debt ceiling is reached. Um, if there is not a solution by then, the consequences become much bigger. So in, in terms of, we were, as, like you said in, in the story, we, we saw Congressman Lee Hamilton say that these weren't as frequent as they were decades ago. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a new thing? Are we going to be seeing more of these deadlocks in the future? For a time, yes, we probably will, because uh, the problem here is that although we like to think that every member of the House of Representatives thinks about the, the whole nation when he or she votes, they are elected by specific districts, and some of these districts are in rural Oklahoma and have very different views from those districts that are in uh, Center City, Chicago. And the folks who are elected from rural Oklahoma and lots of other places like that have a lot of Tea Party support in their district. And that Tea Party support is telling them, go for it, keep the government shut down. Well, you know, the more we shut it down, the more they'll realize we don't even need a government at, 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 at all. Um, so they are hearing things that are different from what we're hearing. And they're hearing, keep up the shutdown. 800 people have already applied in Indiana for unemployment benefits. Um, there's also been talk that Congress will retroactively reinstate some of the money that's being lost right now. But So this is not about saving money. What's this all about? This is about uh, the Republicans in the House making a last-ditch attempt to stop the Affordable Care Act. They have the right to do so. Um, on the other hand, those folks who carry around constitutions in their pocket know that there is a procedure for passing laws. The House and the Senate pass the law. The President signs it. The Supreme Court, if it's asked, decides whether it's constitutional or not, and then the bureaucracy implements it. We've had that procedure. It's over. It's done. This is the law. So this is a last-ditch attempt to go around that congressional and constitutional process by which the Affordable Care Act became law. When will the shutdown be begin to affect more people, and, and who should be worried when, if this were to continue? I think the, real, uh, the really scary time is when the debt ceiling limit is reached on October 17th. Uh, that could affect the credit of the United States, which means if we're downgraded, we're going to have to pay a lot more interest for people to buy our treasury bonds and various other kinds of securities. We're all being affected now in ways that most of us don't even see day to day. Um, but it's probably not going to stop uh, until the, the Republicans decide that this is going against them politically. Okay, well, thank you very much for adding your perspective. Now we go over to Alex Dierkman for a look at this week's headline headlines. Alex, there's a lot going on in addition to the government shutdown. There is, Joe. The Hoosier state line is still running as Amtrak and state officials work on a deal to fund the service. The Hoosier state line is still making the same trip between Indianapolis and Chicago four days a week. That despite a midnight deadline on Monday for Amtrak and the State Department of Transportation to reach an agreement to fund the Hoosier state line, that came and went without a deal. In a statement, an Amtrak spokesperson wrote, We're in talks with NDOT for a short-term agreement to prevent a Hoosier state service interruption by mid-October so as to allow time to negotiate a longer-term contract. NDOT spokesperson Will Wingfield told WTIU News last week the loss of $3 million in federal funding will hit October 16th. 
In 2008, the federal government announced it would cut funding to rail lines less than 750 miles beginning in 2013. We're looking to the local officials to help be part of that solution as well. We're, uh, so we've had some very productive discussions with uh, the local officials from all of the different cities that have stops along the Amtrak route, um, and, and we're having productive discussions with Amtrak as well. So, you know, we're optimistic that, uh, you know, some type of solution will be found, but of course those discussions are still fluid and ongoing. INDOT released the results of a cost-benefit analysis last week. It examined four different improvement scenarios and found that the cost of operating and maintaining the rail would range from nearly $4 million a year to $10 million a year. On top of that, infrastructure improvements would cost another $230 million. Indiana is the only state in the Midwest affected by the loss of funding that has failed to reach an agreement with Amtrak to continue the rail service. A committee of state lawmakers charged with reviewing a new set of nationally crafted academic standards held its final meeting on Tuesday. They adjourned without making a recommendation on what Indiana should do about those new standards called the Common Core. The General Assembly passed a law halting the rollout of the standards in Indiana classrooms at the end of last session, even though some schools in the state already ha had already started using them. The Common Core Study Committee could schedule could schedule another meeting this month to approve a recommendation, but it's likely their report will go to the state board in November without one. The state board has until July 1st to make a final decision on what academic standards Indiana schools will use next. The Farm Bill expired Tuesday, leaving farmers with little clue on what to expect in the coming months. As Claire McInerney reports, the current bill establishes the rules for crop insurance and farm subsidies and provides funding for food stamps. Congress hasn't passed a new farm bill in five years. Instead, every year, legislators have voted to extend the one from 2008. But a proposed new version of the bill would eliminate billions of dollars, including direct payments to farmers, money that the government pays to these farmers no matter how much they plant or how much they yield. That is actually a position that our farmer uh, members have, have agreed uh, to uh, to remove from the bill. So in this time of austerity and uh, difficult financial circumstances, even our farmers understand that uh, they needed to play their part and do their part in terms of reducing the, the federal deficit. Most of the debate now surrounds the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, commonly known as food stamps. Republicans want to make dramatic cuts to the program, something Democrats oppose. And that's put farmers in the middle, waiting for a decision so they can budget for the year ahead. Farmers are used to dealing with uncertainty, such as crop prices, weather, and food trends. Those kind of things are all built in uncertainties for them, and they're willing to deal with the other side of the market. What they don't want is a bunch of built-in uncertainty coming from Washington. Although it missed the October 1st deadline, Congress still has some time before it has to take definitive action on the Farm Bill. That's because the previous Farm Bill still applies to most crops that are in the ground. On the first of the year, though, a milk subsidy would expire, causing milk prices to double. And that's something lawmakers agree they want to avoid. Farm fatalities in Indiana are at their highest level since 2008. 26 people died last year. That was an increase of nearly two-thirds from the previous year. Tractors accounted for nearly half of the, of the fatalities. The authors of the safety report characterized the data as, quote, a dramatic reversal in the downward trend in the frequency of fatalities over the past four years. Historically, farm fatality numbers have been higher in counties with significant Amish populations. Some good news, though. The report found that the number of children aged 18 and younger dying in agricultural workplaces has been decreasing. Joe? Okay, thank you very much, Alex. And coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Health officials are urging Hoosiers not to get discouraged if they encounter problems signing up for health care online. Where the uninsured can go for help and what's on the line if they don't sign up. Our state impact education reporting team has been following Indiana switchover to a new set of academic standards. Will Indiana students have to take two standardized tests next year? and an area winery powered by the sun and how the owner's alternative energy investment is paying off. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Next time on Frontline, get ready to change the way you see the game. The brain is riddled with disease. These players come down with dementia and then Alzheimer's and then they're gone. Frontline investigates what the NFL knew and when they knew it. The level of denial was just profound. The Inside Story. You can't go against the NFL, they'll squash you. Tuesday evening at 9. 
People are looking for more light and less heat. Washington Week viewers are going to get it straight ahead, and that's what they count on us for. When we do these roadshows, it not only helps me, but it helps all of our panelists to find out what is really on people's minds. We want to let you know what the information is, and then you decide what you want to think. That's what I think is unique about public broadcasting. There's nothing else like it out there. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The health care exchanges went online this week in Indiana and estimated 888,000 un uninsured Hoosiers could use the marketplace to apply for insurance. And more than half of those would likely be eligible for some type of financial assistance. The pressure is on to get people to sign up. But as Sarah Whitmire reports, a number of obstacles, everything from technical delays with the website to political clashes are standing in the way. Jonathan Prather is a lot like yeah, most Americans when it comes to what he knows about the Affordable Care Act. I don't know that much. I know that I know that I'm applicable. That I know I have to sign up or something, don't I? Yes, all uninsured Americans have to be covered by 2014, or they'll be fined. Do you know what the penalty is? The fine is $95 a year for adults, or one percent of their income, whichever is greater. It increases each year. Of course, if you're insured, those fines don't matter. So let's back up. How do you get insured? The healthcare marketplaces that went online this week are really meant for people who don't have employment sponsored coverage. They can get online, shop around, and purchase insurance at a reduced rate from one of the four providers on Indiana's exchange. About 888,000 people are eligible in Indiana. Folks like Prather, he's self employed. For two and a half years, he's run this skate shop in Bloomington. I have three pairs. And whether the exchanges work depend on whether people like him sign up. And a recent Kaiser Health poll showed only 12 percent of the uninsured knew the exchanges were going online Monday. To me, it's kind of been surrounded by mystery because you haven't heard too much about it, just like bits and snippets from friends or neighbors or whatever. It's scary. Uh, I think it's uh, not terribly surprising, to be honest. I mean, health care can be confusing. Uh, this, the ACA has obviously been the object of, of a lot of political debate, uh, and that's not going to end anytime soon. As the vice president of Indiana's Hospital Association, Brian Tabor wants the exchanges to work. At the association's annual conference this week in Carmel, he and his colleagues were spending a lot of time talking about their role in getting people signed up. The reality is financially there's a lot riding on this for hospitals. One of the things the Affordable Care Act did was reduce payments to providers, hospitals being the largest group. In Indiana, it's about $4 billion over 10 years. What we have is funding that would normally flow to hospitals through the Medicare system is now kind of at risk and it's depending upon, dependent upon people signing up for insurance. So we have a lot riding on getting people enrolled uh, as soon as possible. Hospitals are playing a key role in signing up the uninsured. Many have trained navigators or people who can provide counseling sessions and enroll people in the insurance programs. At libraries across the state, staff members have been preparing for months for the exchanges to go live. Every time the, the, the government or uh, the state government comes up with some sort of a new plan that is online, we anticipate that people are going to need help figuring out how to navigate these things. And community members are preparing to distribute flyers and host informational health care fairs. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask me. If you ask somebody what they know about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, it's all about, you know, kind of the political scorekeeping. It's not about the program or how it will help people or how it would be useful to them. And so, of course, the uninsured are are very confused and, and uninformed about it. On college campuses, volunteers are being deployed to get young people signed up. Particular attention is being paid to this age group, which has been termed the young invincibles because they don't have health conditions and they're not worried about getting signed up. In the long run, uh, it's probably not sustainable if it only the, the sickest Americans sign up for, for the marketplace. Back at his skate shop, that argument seems to be the thing that touches Prather the most. I definitely think, like, yeah, I, I think health care should be for everyone, you know? And so I think if, if me being able to, like, pay a little bit and get insurance and that also making it possible for other people to do that as well, I would be into that for sure, yeah. 
Sarah Whitmire joins us here in the studio for more to continue with Prather. If he were to get insurance, how much would he, would he have to cost? So it's a really hard question to kind mm -hmm. of answer because there are so many different factors. We have to know some things about Prather. So we know he lives in Bloomington. We know he's 31 years old. You have to know whether someone's single, marries. We know he's single. We know he doesn't have any kids. You have to know the income. So I'm projecting $30,000. Um, and then also, just for the sake of this, I'll presume that he doesn't smoke. So based on all of those things, he would qualify for a subsidy of about $1,100 a year. So if he were to sign up for the bronze plan, which is the lowest level plan, then his out-of-pocket expenses, expenses each month would be about $138 roughly. But uh, the bronze plan is the lowest level plan you can get under the Affordable Care Act. It's the minimum that you're required to get. And it goes up from there, of course. What kind of coverage would he get with that lower, lowest level bronze? Well, okay, so regardless of the plan, there are four. There's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Each plan offers the same benefit, things like ambulance service, uh, prescriptions, dentist, uh, prenatal care, anything that you would think of when you think medical expenses is pretty much covered. But what varies is how much you pay. So if you get in at that bronze level, you're going to have a lower premium that you pay each month, but then say Prather needs to go to the doctor, which he's a skateboarder, it probably happens a lot. If he needs to go to the doctor, he's going to have to pay more when he goes to the doctor. And so we did check that the online is back up and going. I know it wasn't earlier this week, so people can sign up and they have through March. They have through the end of March to sign up. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. There have been a series of meetings this week in Indianapolis working through a bunch of potential changes in education. Our state impact team has been busy. Kyle Stokes has been following Indiana's switch over to a new set of academic standards. And the possibility, Kyle, that Indiana students will have to take two standardized tests this year? Two. It's a bit of an outside uh -huh. chance, Joe, but it is a possibility. Some of the state's education policy watchers are concerned your kids might have to sit for two high-stakes statewide tests like the I-STEP come spring 2015. State officials say it won't come to that, but it's still possible in this very complicated scenario. Remember, Indiana's potentially making the switch to new nationally crafted academic standards called the Common Core. New standards require new tests, but skepticism about the new standards prompted state lawmakers to throw the brakes on common Common Core's implementation. So to follow lawmakers' instructions next school year, Indiana students might have to take both the old test and a new test to match whatever standards the state adopts next. Two tests at nearly twice the price, potentially close to $60 million. Again, state education officials say they have a contingency plan in place. Tensions are nearly boiling over at meetings of Indiana's top education panel these days. This week's meeting was no different. State Superintendent Glenda Ritz and members of the State Board of Education spent minutes at Wednesday's meeting arguing over, of all things, the meeting agenda. The friction comes from a dispute over who controls the board. Is it Governor Mike Pence, who appoints its members and recently took control of the board's budget? Or is it the state superintendent, who has traditionally chaired the meetings? Relations have gotten so strained that one board member suggested this week the panel schedule a private retreat to sort things out. And finally, are there too many Indiana school districts that enroll too few students? About five years ago, Governor Mitch Daniels essentially called on dozens of districts to consolidate. How many took up that call? Well, as Stateline reported this week, just two, 51 districts across the state, as you can see on this map that we posted on stateimpactindiana.org, enroll fewer than 1,000 students, including many right here in our area. One of the smallest is, in fact, not that far from Bloomington and Columbus and Medora Community School Corporation. That has just over 200 students. Mitch Daniels wants, di wants districts that look like about 2,000 students back when he was governor, so we wanted to start a discussion about this and ask if any of these districts that you see on our website could pair up. It's a fun discussion, but it's also a very serious community matter. After all, we aren't the ones who have to ride the bus across the county to get to school, Joe. Okay, thank you very much, Kyle, for that report. And a family-owned winery just south of Spencer is installing a $40,000 solar energy system. The hope is it will reduce the winery's energy cost and educate people on the effectiveness of green energy. It's a gray, rainy day in southern Indiana, and Preston Leaderbrand is walking between the rows of grapes at his vineyard in Spencer. 
He stops to check the grapes, tasting them for ripeness and sweetness. Leader Brand worked hard all his life in the coal mines of central Illinois. When he retired nine years ago, he and his wife Bonnie purchased 40 acres in Owen County. My son had two young grandsons of mine, so he convinced me to move closer, or us to move closer. Owen Valley Winery was born when the Leader Brand's son and daughter-in-law planted test rows of grapes on the property. Together, the four of them own the growing business. The Leader Brand served their award-winning wine in the tasting room they built themselves. People come from all over to taste our wine, to, to buy it. We're in retail stores now. This rocket ship that we built here just continues to climb. There's no end in sight. Owen Valley's newest project and its most distinctive feature is 34 solar panels on the roof of the winery. The solar panels will provide 60% of the winery's energy. Now the leader brands can boast their winery as the first in the Midwest to run on sunshine. I was able to get online and be able to um, see what the solar did today. And as cloudy as it was and everything, it still put out energy, and I could not believe that. It actually worked. The Leader Brands received help from a USDA grant program that provides funds to agricultural producers and rural small businesses to purchase renewable and more efficient energy systems. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.